but today we're doing ecological relationships. You will have plenty of time. I know I've been lecturing and you guys kind of do work while I'm lecturing. Um, you're gonna have about 40 minutes or more. When I'm done, you'll have plenty of time. So if you could hold off on those other things, um, tomorrow, you guys are working on the exam review. No new content. Put the phone away, please. No new content. You'll just have that exam review to do. Um, I'm going to fix these. We know nothing is ever 1159. It's just the automatic timer. So I'll change those to the 230 time frame. Um, and then Friday, I'm not going to be in class. So on Friday, you will have um, something to do related to the human impact on the environment. So we'll get into that a little bit later. So today, ecological relationships, another easy peasy um, concept. And then you will have plenty of time to complete today's work in class before you ever leave. Um, and then tomorrow you have that review to work on. So do we have any immediate questions? Probably not. What can you tell me about um, carrying capacity? Anybody? In class, out of class. I gotta find my chat box. Yep, there's basically three topics that are gonna come up today. What do you already know? Not what can you search, but any ideas from your background knowledge? Ellie, hello. I haven't seen you in the room in a while. So carrying capacity is going to be new. What about, I don't want to see anybody typing. There's nothing to type right now. Um, what about symbiotic relationships? What can you tell me about those? Okay. So it's not so much that they depend on each other to survive, but they simply have a close relationship, right? Their niches intertwine. Uh, thank you. And can you tell me that about that relationship? Well, like your stomach acid, like there's some bacteria that um, line our stomach that protects against the stomach acid. Okay. okay. The bacteria in our mouth that help break down the food. Right? Okay. Okay. Yep. We have lots of bacteria living on and in us that serve a purpose for us, and then we provide them a home. Um, the third topic we're going to hit today is predator-prey relationships. What can you tell me about that? So let's try to define things without using the word itself. What is a predator? What is prey? Okay. So the predator is the one hunting and the prey is the one being hunted. So this, these all fall under community ecology, talking about studying the relationship between the organisms and um, them, like between species, right? That's our ecological relationship. So communities um, of organisms increase the chance of survival. So you said like they depend on each other for survival um, of one species by using available resources in different ways. And this is part of their niche. So we've kind of already hit some of that ecological relationship when we talked about the food web and the food chain. So that would be community ecology as well. So their role in the food chain is part of their niche, but also the things they do within their environment. So here you have a bunch of mongooses that are eating um, bugs and ticks and insects off of this warthog. So normally the warthog is a scary um, predator in the ecosystem, but not for the mongooses. I watched a video about these guys a couple of weeks ago and it was kind of funny how um, the warthog just comes and lays down wherever there's a mongoose and then the mongoose comes and cleans them up, kind of like being at the spa. So I'm not sure if I heard competition mentioned in our earlier throw out of words. Um, organisms compete with each other for food, for shelter, for water, for mates, right? Probably single species if you talk about mates, but multiple species if you talk about food, shelter. For example, the bears and the wolves both hunt the deer in Yellowstone, right? So there's competition for food. And then we got into the symbiotic relationship, which is simply the close relationship between organisms within the ecosystem. They often depend on each other in one way or another for survival. Here's a common example. Of course, the 
bee and the flowers. We know that the bee pollinates the flowers um, by taking the pollen from one and dusting another flower. And at the same time, it gets food from the flower. So that would be a relationship that has evolved together and that they closely depend on each other. Miranda said there's a few different types of symbiotic relationships. Um, and here are some examples, mutualism where both are benefiting. Uh, you might call this a mutualistic relationship between the zebra and the ostrich. The zebra has poor eyesight, but they have a keen sense of smell. The ostrich has really sharp eyesight, but a poor sense of smell. So these two are going to depend on each other for survival because one can see and one can smell and therefore they can look out for um, predators better than they could if they were living alone. So there is cooperation is another relationship we might have mentioned. Commensalism and parasitism are two others that we'll discuss. So a mutualistic relationship is positive, positive. Both are benefiting in some way. So the ostrich and the zebra both benefited because one couldn't see, but the other could, and one couldn't smell, but the other could. Another common example is this lichen. So out in our woods, we see lichen on the um, trees and maybe rocks even. This is actually not one single organism, but it's two living together. So it's the algae and the fungi. So the algae we know has chloroplast, it can photosynthesize, it produces food. Um, and then the lichen gives it a substrate to attach to. So this, it provides it basically a home. Um, so these two are living in close proximity together, like intertwined with each other actually at the cellular level so that one can provide substrate and one can provide the food. Did you guys know algae live in the hair of sloths as well? That's kind of cool. So lichen is a mixture of fungi and algae. It's not a single organism. <clears throat> so a lot of mutualistic relationships will have something to do with food and shelter. Commensalism, this was, I think, I don't remember if this was mentioned this hour or just last hour. But there's lots of um, bird species, many egret species that ride around on these grazing organisms, the larger types like the rhinoceros, the elephant, the cow. Like in Florida, you can see cattle egret all over the place and they're riding on the cows and they're eating the cows bugs, just like the warthog and the mongoose. The, um, the cow seems to be unaffected, so it's not benefiting and it's not harming, but the bird is getting the food from the cow. So, um, so in this case, the bird benefits, but the cow doesn't benefit, nor is he harmed. So that would be commensalism. When one is a plus and one is a zero, neither hurt nor harmed. And then parasitism, probably the one you're probably most familiar with if you have any pets, I'm sure you give your pets some medicine to keep them from getting worms. You take them to the doctors, you give them um, heartworm medicine, flea and tick medicine. Um, so parasitism is when one is benefiting and the other one is hurt. So this is a tapeworm living inside of a human's intestine. Other common parasites are ticks and fleas, um, there's lots of different worms, roundworms, hookworms. There's lots of different um, insects like mosquitoes. Um, there's protozoans. So they can be external or internal. And if the host dies, the parasite will have to find a new host. Otherwise it would die as well. So it would actually want to keep its host alive just to provide its food and shelter for a longer period of time. So we have competition, we have cooperation, we have symbiosis, and then we have our predator-prey relationships. So the predator 
is the one that's doing the hunting and the prey is the one being hunted for. So I think probably all of these in my picture up here, I was just gonna say, which one of these are predators, which ones are prey, but looking at them, they're probably all prey in this picture. Um, so we gave the example of the wolves in Yellowstone, that would be a predator. And then the prey would be the deer that they are trying to hunt. We should be familiar with a predator prey relationship um, graph. You'll see this, um, you might see it on our final exam. You see it quite often on those standardized tests. So I can recognize that oscillation, that up and down fluctuation of two lines. I also notice that there's a lag time between the peaks. So like the snowshoe hare is the one, is the prey, right? And the predator is the lynx. So I can see that the prey numbers are very high. Actually, they're all higher than the predators, right? And that makes sense if I think about my pyramid of numbers. Remember at each trophic level, you can support less organisms. So it would make sense that the bottom level would have more organisms than the top level. So I can see that typically the lynx numbers are low here, which allows the snowshoe hares to breed, reproduce, and not worry about getting eaten. And so their numbers increase. And when their numbers are, are increasing, there's more food available for the lynx. So the lynx have more opportunity to eat and breed and reproduce. So we'll see a lag time between the peaks of the prey and the peak of the predator. And then as the predator eats all the snowshoe hares, the number's gonna crash, right? So what happens after that? The lynx start to starve and then their numbers crash. And because then the lynx numbers are low, there's no more predators, the prey starts to repopulate. So you'll see this recovery and decline, and then you'll see the lag behind it because the one relies on the other, right? So that's the predator prey cycle. Here are some adaptations that you would see. Remember, adaptations are beneficial evolutionary um, traits. So, what do you think? Would this be the trait of a predator or a prey? Some live in groups. What do you guys think? Predator or prey adaptation? Is this going to be more beneficial to the prey? Or do you think it's more beneficial to a predator? Here's an example of the cheetah and the gazelle. Okay, that's an idea. And when you said there's more of them, the prey or the predator, did you say prey or predator? Okay, yeah, my brain took in the other way. Yes. So also like we, you know, when we go out, we like, we go out in a pack, right? Cause there's a protection in numbers. So you're right. Some of them, they could split and divide um, the attention of the predator. So they're not all getting eaten, but also um, that's more eyes for lookout, right? You're able to see the predators um, if there's more of you in the group. Okay, what about this one? Built for speed, who's that gonna benefit? Or who is this more likely a, an evolution adaptation for? The predator or the prey? The predator, yep. Typically predators are built for speed. What about sharp teeth and claws? Who's more likely to have that? The predator or the prey? The predator. Mm -hmm. Camouflage to avoid being seen. Predator or prey? More likely the prey. It's a defense mechanism. Eyes in the front of the head, judging size and distance. Predator. Predator. Mm -hmm. um, defenses such as poisons or stings. Prey. And then eyes to the side of the head to get a wide field of view. Pray, mm -hmm. yep, allows them to look around a little better. Okay, uh, I forgot I double animated that one. <clears throat> so predators kind of keep the prey numbers 
stable, right? And then we saw this that the amount of prey kind of keeps the predator numbers stable. So if we go back to this predator prey graph, oh, I'm gonna go back. This predator prey graph, we see that the prey or, or the predator really never gets above maybe 80 ish. So the amount of snowshoe hares in their area can only feed up to maybe 80, right? So this is going to introduce that concept of carrying capacity. So carrying capacity is like the most organisms that an ecosystem can hold. And this is really more of a population ecology rather than um, community ecology, but I forgot to throw it in last week. So I'm throwing it in here and I'm making the connection with the predator prey because the predators are one of those things that can act as a limiting factor. The prey can act as a limiting factor. The prey limit the number of predators that the ecosystem can support and vice versa. The predator limits how many prey um, the ecosystem can support. So here we can see a whole lot of zebra. Do you think that this um, ecosystem could probably support that many zebra without being damaged itself? Okay, so there's probably going to be some predators come in, makes easy target. There's tons of them there. So they also need to find water, shelter, food themselves, and they are grazing animals, right? The more grazing animals you have, the less grass you're going to have. We got to keep that pyramid of numbers in check. So that introduces carrying capacity. So all organisms will grow indefinitely like this right here if they don't have limiting resources. So this is a specific um, effort to bring back the numbers of African elephants. So you'll see this exponential growth when organisms are new to an area and they have no limiting resources or no limiting factors. You'll also see it quite often when there's a conservation effort for an organism. <clears throat> Once they've reached their carrying capacity, they won't be able to continue to populate as quickly, right? That number is going to level off. Once they get enough hairs, the lynx is going to eat them and it's going to level them off. Once the grasses are gone, the zebra won't be able to continue reproducing, right? And they're going to level off. So that is what you call your carrying capacity. The maximum number of organisms an eco ecosystem can support without being affected or destroyed. Many factors play a role in limiting those. I mentioned the predator prey. What else might be a limiting factor that keeps the number of organisms in check? What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. The amount of resources available. Yeah, anything that they're competing for. Shelters, mates, water, food. Weather can be a limiting factor. There could be droughts that fluctuate by year or by time of year. So even this carrying capacity might fluctuate by year or by time of year. Um, disease is a limiting factor. So the closer, like the more populated an organism, a group is, the more likely a disease will spread. And we've seen that, right? We're trying to like, keep our distance so we're not as densely populated. That picture before, there was a ton of zebras in one small space. If, that, if they got disease, it would be able to wipe through there pretty quickly. In this picture, there's just the mom and the baby and nobody else in this picture. So it's probably not gonna spread the disease to a larger population. <clears throat> so this is showing you more of that fluctuation right around the carrying capacity. So sheep were introduced to Tanzania in 1825. So when they first came in, they didn't have any predators and they had all the resources they could handle, right? Because they were new to the area. So they populated very quickly. But once they started getting close to that um, carrying capacity, then they start to die off and they can have rebounds and die off and rebounds and die off. And they're going to fluctuate right around that, um, right around that carrying capacity. I liked this analogy 
Um, the two little bu liter bucket holds about two liters. And if you get more than that, it's gonna start to spill out, right? So there is damage to the ecosystem once it begins to overpopulate. Um, in this case, we can hold the ecosystem contained. And in this case, it's starting to fracture the ecosystem. So it's gone past it. Um, it's past its limit, right? It's past its carrying capacity. <clears throat> on the test, on the exam, you'll have a picture similar to this one. So A, B, C, D, E are your letters. Which one would represent the carrying capacity? What do you guys think? E is the carrying capacity. This is the level that it can support. Declining populations. Come on guys, it's more fun when you talk. C, Evan says C. Declining population right here. The numbers are going down. Exceeding resources. Where does it exceed the resources? Where is it past its carrying capacity and it's going to start to just die off? B is correct. Mature, thriving population. This is D. Mm -hmm. So it's referring to the population that is at its, its capacity, but it's not declining, right? So it's thriving. Quickly growing population, the beginning of the graph shows that exponential growth, so A. So you should be familiar with a carrying capacity graph come exam day. What do you guys think? Will we reach our carrying capacity? Have we reached our carrying capacity? The claim is yes. What is your reasoning or evidence? Okay. Yeah, when we say the carrying capacity is the maximum number it can sustain without harming the ecosystem, in order to make room for us, we have to harm the ecosystem, don't we? <clears throat> is our population fluctuating right around our carrying capacity? Okay, so if we have a greater birth rate than death rate, um, then our population is continuing to grow. Mm -hmm. We do see plagues every handful of years now, don't we? That is causing numbers to decline. It's happened this past year. I don't know how our numbers of death has compared to the birth rates. Um, but there is definitely a fluctuation of our population that has been affected by various plagues, plagues over the handful of years. It's all controversial. Okay, so that's just a thought. Like I said, Friday, your activity will be a human impact. Um, you'll be researching one of several concepts. And normally we do a poster and then we do a walk around. Um, I'm gonna think about how we wanna do that because we have the digital group and then we have a live group. If we still wanna do posters or if we wanna do a digital presentation or if you want a choice of either one. Um, but that's, that's the topic we're gonna to hit on Friday. And let's just say there won't be a Zoom on Friday since I'll be in the, um, getting a procedure. So I won't, be on, I won't be on Zoom. There will be a sub in class. Um, what questions do you have about that? Okay, so we have a whole hour, you guys. Lots of time. Um, the first item on our list is this POGO. So it's an abbreviated one. I've cut out the la like half of it. So you have the predator-prey relationship that we need to be familiar with. And then you have your um, symbiosis. So it's just those two topics that won't take you maybe 20 minutes. Okay, we have an hour, so there's no reason we shouldn't be able to get that done in class. The Zoom people, after you finish that one, you are welcome to get off the Zoom after you've turned it in and work on your own. Um, we have a number of CK-12s related to this week's topics. Um, symbiosis, predation, yada, yada. You should have time to complete those that are relevant to today, I think. Um, and then you could 
like, you know, the ones for today would be symbiosis, predation, and competition. So you would have time for that one. These up here are going to be saved for next week. Friday's topic. Okay. All right. What questions do you have? What can I help you with? So everybody's working on the poll now. And then we're going to get that turned in today. And then you can work on the um, CK-12s. And tomorrow we have the review.